The Macintosh TV is one of the most obscure Apple products. An ill-fated 1993 attempt to cross a Macintosh with a fully functional television. And for several reasons, it was a total flop. But in recent years, it has become quite the collector's item because, well, it was one of the only 90s all-black Macintoshes. Well, almost all black. And yet, somehow, I've come across two of them. So stay tuned. And if you enjoyed tinkering around with the ridiculous, beautiful dregs of computing history, I hope you'll consider subscribing to the channel. In 1983, legendary punk rock pioneers Black Flag released their iconic song, TV Party. Exactly 10 years later, Apple released the Macintosh TV, an underpowered computer that combines a 32 MHz 6830 Mac with video inputs and a built-in TV tuner. Coincidence? That's not for me to say. What I can say is, let's see what's on TV. Hmm. Doesn't seem like there's anything on. Let's call Apple support and see if they can help us find any quality Apple original programming. No, 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 please don't move. No, no, no. Apple support, have you tried resetting the PRAM? Hi, I'm trying to use your newfangled Apple Macintosh TV to watch some quality Apple original programming, like Ted Lasso and the Beanie Bubble. Okay, sir, what do you see on the screen? Yeah, it's the classic Mac OS 7 desktop. Weirdos. So when I first came across these two Macintosh TVs, neither one of them worked, and not for any lack of care. They spent years in my friend's grandfather's shop being used as they were intended, as TVs that doubled as Macs. But over the years, the capacitors in this thing inevitably leak, messing with the electronics on the motherboard. Good thing we know a certain wizard of capacitance, Steve from Mac84, who you definitely have not already seen in this video. No, 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 leave that dust. <laughs> I like it. Oh, it this adds is... <laughs> to the ambiance. This is really uh, goopy over here. Oh, that's a problem. It's blurry. Ugh. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, it's like crying. <laughs> what did you do to this? Oh yeah, it's haunted. <laughs> oh, I can smell it already. I guess it just couldn't resist. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I am now filming for the inevitable explosion. Wait, what explosion? <laughs> oh, I've rigged this up uh, with little firecrackers just as a prank. Ones. Okay, that's good. Hey! <laughs> Finally, we can watch TV. I'm as surprised as you are. <laughs> as you can see, after I fully repaired these boards, definitely on my own with no help whatsoever, they both worked. That's right. I have two working Macintosh TVs out of about 10,000 that were ever made for the whole world. So I'm going to very scientifically pick one for us to goof around with and See how the TV and computer parts of this interact. Eeny, meeny, miny, mac, Michael Spindler plastics crack. Check this out. If this isn't the coolest thing ever. <laughs> the power button on the remote turns this thing on because, yeah, we're going to take a look around this. But up here, what is normally the microphone on the other series of this computer, like the LC520 that this is based on. This is now an infrared pickup for the remote. You can also gracefully power down the machine from the remote. It doesn't just turn off, it does a real shutdown. <laughs> That's hilarious. And now, something I'm really curious about, can I actually control the Macintosh from across the room using this infrared remote? Ha! 
Okay, so we've just kind of been goofing off with this thing, but let's take it a little more seriously because this is actually still running off of its original spinning hard drive, which miraculously works. But I want to replace that with a version 2 blue SCSI, which uh, is my go-to solution at this point for SCSI drive replacements. And I'm actually running a super secret version of the firmware on here with some exciting new features. I'll save most of those for a dedicated video though. For now, let's crack this thing open and also talk a little bit about why it failed. Right after this word about today's sponsor, PCBWay. Not only does PCBWay offer high quality PCB prototyping and production, but they also offer on-site PCB assembly. And they can source some of the components with their turnkey service. PCBWay also offers a ton of additional services like high quality 3D printing, injection molding, CNC machining. They even offer sheet metal fabrication. And if you're looking for ideas for projects, check out their shared projects section with tons of cool stuff submitted by other PCBWay users. So if you have any PCB or prototyping needs, I hope we'll give PCBWay.com a try. Okay, so the Macintosh TV was actually based on the LC520, which is a machine in the same form factor, just not black, beige. But this, this was a bit hobbled. You see, the LC520 could go up to 36 megs of RAM. This is ROM limited to eight megs of RAM. For some unknown reason, they decided that no matter how big of a stick of compatible memory you put in here, I think this is a 10 meg stick, there are four megs of RAM soldered to the motherboard. And uh, yeah, a four meg stick is the most that this will recognize in this slot here, which is a crying shame. The 32 megahertz 68030 isn't really a deal breaker, even though at that time, late 1993, you could get 68040 machines. And uh, yeah, it just had a cool party trick in that you could put video and audio into it so you can hook up your Nintendo. And it has a TV tuner here with a coax connector. But honestly, Apple was kind of targeting these towards college dorm rooms where the room would be pretty small and having a TV and computer in the same device might make sense. Except it didn't, really. People instead opted to buy a better TV and a better Macintosh and save money over the $2,000 price tag of this machine. And to replace the hard drive, uh, as a bit of a blessing and a curse, the drive is actually on this very convenient sled, which made upgrading back in the day very easy and convenient. Unfortunately, today, these plastics are extremely brittle. And yeah, if we try to pull this drive out, some part of this sled might crack. But let's give it a shot anyway. And this is extra difficult because I <laughs> hurt my wrist skateboarding because I am a grown adult man. There we go, the original 80 megabyte SCSI hard drive. I'm gonna take it off of the sled here and see if we can mount the blue SCSI to this sled. All right, here it is assembled. It's a pretty nifty little sandwich of stuff. Let's see if it makes connection. Not quite. All right, so this bracket doesn't actually align it, so I just have it kind of floating in there, which is fine for now. And I'm gonna have to modify this bracket to align it. Needs to go over a little bit. But this will be good for us to mess around with it. All right, let's see if she boots off of the blue SCSI. And uh, yes, I was skateboarding again. Hey! Okay, so this is actually an image that Steve set up when we were testing the recapped boards. Look at this nice little rainbow color 
icon there for the hard drive. But this has the uh, correct driver and control panel for the TV already installed. You can set up a hotkey to switch between TV and Macintosh if you don't want to use the controller. TV sound in computer mode. Uh, I don't actually know what that does. I get, oh, you can listen to the TV while you're working on the computer. That's what this means, TV sound and computer mode, but you can't watch the TV. Okay, let me give you an example of how poor the performance is on this machine though, with my go-to benchmark, Wolfenstein 3D. Oh my goodness, that is pretty terrible. Okay, so we can't exactly test out the TV portion of this with over-the-air broadcast signals because those don't exist anymore. I know, how about another 1993 black plastic flop? An Atari Jaguar. That's right, hilariously, the renowned console flop Atari Jaguar also came out in 1993. However, what it does have is the best version of Wolfenstein 3D ever made. <laughs> Just look at that, the Jaguar logo <laughs> on my Macintosh. Uh. I almost hit enter on the keyboard. All right, so the thing that really sets the Jaguar version of Wolfenstein 3D apart is a special difficulty mode called Maximum Death. And it is my favorite way to play Wolfenstein 3D. Not only is it more difficult, but a lot of the power-ups have been replaced by other enemies. And uh, this is also a pretty good test of this screen. You know, this is a Sony Trinitron, but this is a little fuzzier than I'd expect. Certainly fuzzier than it would be on my TV that I normally play this on. So I do want to test out the TV tuner portion of this. So I've got out my General Electric Top Loader VHS player. And I also have absolutely no idea whether this thing works. So we will discover that together. First, I'll go into TV mode here and power. What channel does this have to be on? Probably here, right? Oh yeah, look at that. <laughs> it does something. No better way to test this out than with The Menagerie parts one and two on glorious VHS. All right, I'm gonna say this VCR is not in proper working condition. But that is enough on itself to let me know that at least the RF input does work. I mean, I could break out a Nintendo, but uh, I don't know where that is right now, buried in my basement somewhere. Okay, so that'll do it for this look and uh, kind of goofing off with the Macintosh TV, and I still can't believe that I have two of them. I think I might try to trade the other Macintosh TV with someone, maybe at the next VCF East. In any event, uh, this is not the last time you'll see this machine because I have an upcoming video on all the cool new stuff that's in the blue SCSI, and <laughs> trust me, there's some pretty cool features. I think we might even Wi-Fi this thing. And if you enjoyed this video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up Ow. And if you'd like to see more shenanigans like this, please subscribe down below. And thank you very much for watching. And a special thanks to Alex Hoffman, Andrew Nicholson, April White, Camila Noseda, Chris Allegretta, Chris Biggs, Chris Calderon, Chris Nelson, Control Alt Reese, Daniel Hubbard, Frodo Jedi, Gaspar Heller, George Rosansky, Greg Rutke from Rutke Mods, Harris Brody, James Fryman, James Laurie, Jason Papaz, Jason Ezel, Justin Reed, Lyle Truid, Matthew Kroll, Paul Spencer, Ryan, Scott Cedarbaum, Scott Thompson, Sutek, Tom Woodfin and Unknown Soldier 41, who are my highest tiered patrons and all of my Patreon supporters for helping to make these videos possible. No, 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 no. 
No, 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 please. No, no, no. Apple support. Have you tried resetting the PRAM? <laughs>